Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story. Hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that will determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the states you're listening to. They happen to be my views, and well, for the next hour, they're going to be the views of Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Uh, Dr. Cuddy, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me. And what are we going to be talking about this afternoon? Well, it's the uh, <clears throat> uh, book I did that uh, was carried by Radio Liberty, the uh, Power Elite, Their History and Future. And uh, we <clears throat> are picking up uh, with the chapter that's uh, called, uh, called the Power Elite's Use of Misdirection, which is sort of a, a follow-on to the <clears throat> previous chapter, which is the psychological conditioning of Americans uh, but as usual, I like to give uh, a few comments on matters of contemporary interest uh, in the news. And uh, there's actually uh, a number of them this time. But it, I think it's important to, to do this because uh, my books are not only about the, the history and where this plot, as it were, came from and how it's very, been very, very well organized over many, many centuries, but the whole purpose in doing that is to connect it to where we are and where we're headed. Uh, a lot of people do historical research, period. A lot of people just sort of guess at what the, the future uh, has to hold. Uh, and a lot of people can offer remarks about what's going on today and what they think about it. Uh, the, the trick, as it were, and what I try to do is uh, combine all three because I, I believe only in that way does it all sort of make sense and has some purpose. Uh, I used to teach history in the public schools, and I myself, when I was in uh, college, uh, preparing to be a uh, uh, basically a history teacher, uh, wondered, like most people did, I guess, young people, uh, why am I doing this? You know, I mean, who cares about somebody, you know, memorizing a date that somebody made the Louisiana, you know, Jefferson made the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, you know, big whoop, who cares? <laughs> you know, it's done, it's, you know, it's, and that's nice. I mean, it's sort of nice if you know it, but if you don't, you know, don't worry about it. You'll you still get up tomorrow and, you know, go to work and make some money and eat, watch ball games or whatever you do. But uh, there's, there's a lot more to what I call history, and it's combined with all of these other things. The history is combined with current events. Uh, it's combined with future forecasting. It's combined with this whole plot that's been in operation for many centuries. Uh, oftentimes, we just pick up with Cecil Rhodes about 100 years ago, but it, it goes way back before then. I mean, Cecil Rhodes just didn't pop up out of nowhere and say, hey, I think I'll take over the world. I have nothing better to do today. And so even Cecil Rhodes is a product of a... Uh, of a long uh, train of events that began centuries, uh, literally centuries before. I mean, you, you can go back many centuries if you want to, but uh, I usually don't do that much. I go back about a thousand years or so uh, and quickly move uh, to uh, where this is all leading today. So anyway, uh, I try to give these a few remarks on contemporary events because, as I've said a number of times, it's like piecing together a puzzle. You, you'll, ha you'll have these gaps, and all of a sudden you'll see this this little part to a puzzle in, say, 1863 or, you know, whatever the date is, you say, aha, now I see how what happened in the first half of the 1800s connected to the last half of the 1800s and how it is all part of this plan, which when you put the whole piece, the puzzle together, you can see it. You can see it, but otherwise you're just looking at isolated events and they, it doesn't make sense sometimes. And so that's why I encourage people when things don't make sense, look at it from the perspective of how does it help the power elite ultimate goal, which is develop a world government, uh, a world socialist government, and we'll pick up after the break. All right, fine. I think it's so vitally important people understand this is the major goal. I want to use this socialism. It doesn't mean that this is going to be something where you have equality and freedom and government provides for you. It means a totalitarian regime under a ruling elite. They know exactly what they're doing. And of course, have been planning this a long time. 
Well, this is Dr. Stan. I guess this afternoon, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, who's taught history. And basically, we're going to be talking suddenly about the, the background of what's going on today. And that basically, there's been a plan going back certainly through the millennium to bring about a one world government. And yet, of course, this whole plan is coming to its fulfillment today as we're watching this whole thing unfold. And nothing that you see is as it appears to be. Certainly, we see the riots over there in the Ukraine and basically of course there's something about the people over there wanting freedom or not liking the ruler. Basically of course this is being backed on one side by Russia, on the other side by the United States and yet they're both working together for this common goal. The average person involved in these revolutionary movements has no idea what it's all about. He may be killed, he may suddenly lose his home, or there will be all sorts of violence. But all of this is being manipulated. It's the most magnificent and uh, put on of all time uh, as we move progressively towards a one world government and a one world financial system and a one world religion because this is all certainly centered around the destruction of Christianity. Dr. Kenny, you pick up the story. Okay, uh, before I continue with what I was uh, going to say about uh, recent events and uh, what's going on, I'll pick up on what you just said about the events over in the Ukraine. Uh, Oftentimes, as I said last week and many times before, there are psychological probes. Uh, the power elite wants to see just how stupid it has been allowed to make the public, wherever they are, with the Ukraine, the U.S., England, doesn't matter. Uh, and so uh, this is, I think, one of those psychological probes of the, as they call them, freedom fighters in the, uh, the Ukraine. <clears throat> They're counting <clears throat> on the Ukrainians to have been dumbed down sufficiently, just like they've dumbed down Americans and, and many other people, so that what they might be doing, I'm not saying this is for sure what's going on, but uh, if, if anybody knows anybody in the Ukraine and they want to pass this on to them, I would highly recommend that you do this. Uh, because many, many years ago, about 100 years ago, you had a uh, Lenin, and what they would do is they would have the secret police uh, go around and round people up at night. You know, they knock on the door, they're half asleep, and drag them out, and off they would go to disappear into some gulag in Siberia. Well, uh, they had been dumbing the people around the world down pretty well, and so we'll get more recently, quickly, uh, let's run forward up to Tiananmen Square. And so the Chinese, uh, figuring the people of China had been sufficiently kept in the dark or made dumb, that they couldn't use their brains. Remember, all of this was changed from the cognitive thing. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. We'll be back in a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dr. Cuddy is talking about what's going on over in the Ukraine, but it, what's going on in the Ukraine and Kiev today is simply a manifestation of what's been going on for a long period of time. There is a, certainly an intellectual elite. KKMC is not connected. Okay, uh, there is certainly an intellectual elite that are running things throughout the world, and they're constantly manipulating the people. You go right ahead, Dennis. Okay, so uh, what uh, what uh, they did at Tiananmen Square is, that, now remember, this is the, the extremely large and ruthless communist Chinese government who can really, you know, roll a bunch of tanks and shoot a bunch of bullets and kill everybody immediately whenever they want to. But they didn't do that at Tiananmen Square. Uh, they allowed this uh, demonstration and this, uh, you know, Statue of Liberty, sort of their mock-up of it, to be hauled out there in the Tiananmen Square. And a few people came out, you know, maybe a thousand or so, and then it went on for a day, and so all, a lot of other people said, hey, look, you know, looks like freedom's in the air, we'll join in. And so they join in, you know, and hooray, hooray, and then there's tens of thousands and everything is hunky-dory, right? Then all of a sudden, here come the tanks and the whole bit. Now, uh, the tanks do get a little ruthless. They do a, a little bit of, you know, killing. There is some bloodshed. But for the most part, uh, at Tiananmen Square, the communist Chinese know that the foreign press is there watching this stuff and filming it, right? So they don't want to just roll in and have blood all over the where, uh, every place, you know, 100,000 people's crushed bodies laying there for everybody to see. So very, very quietly, uh, the what happens is by the third day, what they've done is they've had enough time, the Chinese uh, communist intelligence agents, to mingle with the crowd, right? And from buildings sitting above the crowd to take photographs. So by the third day, 
what they have is a pretty good idea of who all the leaders are and who all the really strong advocates are and who all who are the just sort of bystanders, you know, standing at the edge and saying, isn't this interesting? And so everything is just sort of quietly it goes down. And, of course, people have to rest. I mean, you can't be out there 24 hours a day jumping up and down, right? And so after the third day, what the Chinese thought was, hey, it looks like, you know, things are okay, a uh, little openness, little glass nose, parasoika version, of, a Chinese version of that, and everything's fine. And so very, very quietly, like on the third day, what happens is the leaders all of a sudden start getting rounded up quickly at night, quietly, right? Oops. And so the next day when people show up, they say, uh, where's, uh, you know, where's Chang? You know, I, I don't see him. He's, you know, he was here yesterday and, you know, he was, he was one of our, what happened to Chang? Well, Chang's gone bye-bye. You know, Chang's got his head bent over to his knees. That's what the Chinese love to do. They, you know, cr- bend your body over and force you to walk sort of hunched over, humiliated like. And so they round them all up and, uh, that's how they handle these, quote, revolutions of democracy. So what, I would advise the Ukrainians to do is watch out. Watch out for the same sort of thing. Now, they think the Ukrainians are stupid. and they're not the Ukrainian people aren't any more stupid than anybody else, but they, the, the leadership hopes they've been dumbed down. So they say, oh, look, a negotiated settlement. Oh, look, a standoff. Oh, look, you know, everything's coming our way. Yes, we will remain vigilant. Yes, yes, we, we're not stupid. We're, the, the problem is the people have to sleep sometime, right? Even the leaders... Even the leaders of the revolt in Kiev have to sleep. And that's when, you know, secretly at night, tippy-toe, up come the Kiev secret police and say, uh, 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 come with us. And then, you know, the, the, you know, a day or two from now, people will start looking around and say, hey, uh, you know, we're, we're our leaders of this revolt in Kiev. And then somebody starts secretly, frantically spreading, well, well uh, they got uh, taken away uh, last night. And so the rest of the people are supposed to become panicked, right? Oh, my God, you know, secretly they got so-and-so, so I better shut up and hide, you know, you know, take a vacation to the Black Sea or we <laughs> get out of town, whatever. And so I, I would just, if you know anybody over there, uh, just alert them to that possibility that that's what this is. Not, I mean, it may not be, but it may be one of these strategic moves on the part of the ruthless uh, secret police in the Ukraine who are allied with the secret police in Russia. Yes, they are still there. Yes, the KGB has just changed its name to protect the guilt, protect the guilty, not the innocent. And so, just just watch it. All right, I know more of that. But. Well, let me just uh, comment, Dennis, because I think it's so vitally important that people understand that if you read my book, certainly uh, Brotherhood of Darkness, we go into the background of the financing of Russia in 1917, 1918, and we've financed the Russians all the way up until the time that the whole economy fell apart in 1990. And then what did we do? Why? Of course, we sent our uh, drilling companies over there, about uh, six or eight drilling companies. We provided the funding. And we put down the oil wells and the gas wells so that Russia would have an income so they could continue being an enemy. You have to have an enemy, the best enemy money could buy. And then, of course, we can have this phony goings-on over there in the Ukraine. But what we do is we find the people who have the courage to take a stand against tyranny. And they're simply done away with because, of course, the last thing the people want who want what this world government is people who believe in freedom or have the integrity to do anything. But remember, we work very closely with Putin. We work very closely with the rulers of China. Why do you think we've given China all sorts of special trade uh, suddenly benefits so that they can bring their products into us without tariffs? Whereas we try to take our products over there why they have tariffs. We have the largest deficit trade deficit with China with any nation in the world. Now, this isn't happening by accident. We're creating the best enemy money could buy, and when you understand that, things going on begin to make sense. Dr. Cuddy, go right ahead. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, not only did we uh, go over there and assist them in deep uh, drilling and oil and so forth, but by doing that, uh, you enable them to have a tool that they could use against Europe. If Europe started to act up, then the Soviets could all, uh, Russians, pardon me, <laughs> uh, the uh, Russians could always say, uh, behave Europe or we will cut off your gas or oil or whatever. So it's not only something to, to, to gin up the Russian economy, but it also could be used as a blackmail tool against Europe. And that's, that's what the parallel does. They constantly do that. They play people against each other. You know, Catholics against Protestants for hundreds of years. Sunnis against uh, Shia. 
uh, you know, West Germans against East Germans, communists against capitalists. You know, Northern Irish against uh, Southern Irish. <laughs> don't, forget, <laughs> don't forget the Democrats against the Republicans. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. The Democrats the, against the Republicans. The right and the left. Go yeah, ahead. right and the left. Yeah. This, the, the old dialectical process. And the public, of course, has been dumbed down, so they never catch on. You know, you would think there's a learning curve here somewhere, but the public never, never clues into to this stuff. And so, uh, speaking of, uh, jobs and what we've done, uh, pick it up on what you were just saying, uh, there's, they count on short-term memories. It's, it's sort of like a politician will do something right after he's elected because he's convinced, and often rightly so, that by the time the next election cycle comes around in four years or whatever, the public will have forgotten, you know, <laughs> because they're really short-term memories. And so, uh, you remember how, uh, we were snookered uh, into, uh, going along and, uh, passing NAFTA and GATT with the World Trade Organization, even though the public, like 75, 80 percent in the polls said, we don't want NAFTA, we don't want GATT, but, uh, they did it anyway. Well, if you, if you, this is what I say is the usefulness in looking at things today and comparing it back to something in the past. So, uh, for example, uh, back when uh, uh, the uh, NAFTA was passed, the year before that, the U.S. Uh, ran a $1.6 billion trade surplus with Mexico, okay? The year before NAFTA, a $1.6 billion trade surplus with Mexico. But a couple of years ago, just a little over a year ago, 2012, we ran a $64 billion deficit. But remember, so deficit. They, they promised us, you know, NAFTA was going to be good because it was going to make more jobs for the right. Americans. Well, they, I think they maybe said more jobs. They didn't say for Americans. But basically, <laughs> of course, what it did, it, the whole idea from the very beginning was just to deceive the American people. We've lost about uh, well over 5 million manufacturing jobs. We only have about 10 million left. And they intend to destroy that as much as they can as they progressively impoverish the American people, Living standards are going down. More and more people are moving from the middle class into poverty. But don't you worry, the government's going to provide for you with food stamps and with housing allotments, certainly, and with free medical care and until they run out of money. And then, of course, the whole thing's got to come toppling down. But then, of course, they'll come up with a new program. But go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, among the... well. <laughs> Uh, NAFTA was supposed to create about, uh, when it was passed, the, the, the projection was to create about 20,000 new high-tech American jobs. You know, yes, we're going to lose a lot of, you know, service industry, but, man, we're going to get them high-paying, high-tech jobs. So the projection was it would create about 20,000 new American jobs, uh, high-tech jobs. But actually, by 2010, uh, NAFTA had eliminated uh, almost 700,000 U.S. jobs and uh, some in every state. Now, that's specifically identified from NAFTA, we, we lost a lot more jobs than that, but specifically regarding NAFTA, what it has cost us is almost uh, 700,000 jobs. And then it's not just NAFTA, because we have these really swift deals with people all over the place. And so a couple of years ago, uh, 2012, uh, there was the uh, Korea, Korea-U.S. trade agreement. See, another great idea to get us a whole lot of jobs, right? And that one was supposed to be even better than NAFTA. You know, we were supposed to create 70,000, 70,000 new U.S. jobs. What happened? Well, we lost 40,000 <laughs> U.S. jobs, specifically uh, as relates to the Korea-U.S. trade agreement, right? And, to boot, uh, the U.S. trade deficit increased by $5.8 billion. See, that's how, we, that's how we get all this economic success, <laughs> We lost, you know, $5.8 billion just from this handy-dandy Korea-U.S. trade agreement. Yeah. And so the American public is uh, basically, yeah, dumb. So anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, one economic view. Uh, the other thing is that's currently, and as I said, well, after the break, I'll tell how that relates to the future. So we look at the past, NAFTA. We look at now Korea. We look at the trade deficit increase. We look at the number of jobs lost. We lost more jobs, not gained more jobs. And after the break, I'll show how this relates to 
the future and how my predictions seem to be coming true. And of course, the next thing is the Trans-Pacific Program. Yep. They have secret negotiations. Why are they secret? Nobody, certainly in Congress, is allowed to know. They're going to have to have an opportunity to vote for it, but they're not going to get the chance to see it ahead of time. Let's see it a couple of hours. The most disastrous has certainly changed in the structure of our society. TPP is coming up, and few people even understand. Go right ahead, Dennis. Yeah, um, <clears throat> what uh, what you also find out is a lot of what we were just talking about is, is sneaky like behind the scenes. For example, all of these free trade agreements, whether it's NAFTA or Korea or, or you know Trans Pacific and, <clears throat> and so forth, <clears throat> uh, when, when they're when they're passed, they, they they the free trade agreements generally began under GATT. It's when when they generally began. <clears throat> And uh, it, it wasn't until those WikiLeaks, remember those famous few years ago WikiLeaks came out, that we learned that uh, the free trade agreements uh, had planned to exempt corporations, uh, including foreign corporations, uh, from American uh, laws governing trade disputes. You know, isn't that handy? <laughs> They're exempt from our laws. Of course, that's what the World Trade Organization, uh, which is a part of GATT, uh, does. Uh, they rule against us 70, you know, 75 percent of the time. They, they actually forced Congress to change our laws. And then I put one specific example in my book, The Globalist, which came out uh, about 14 years ago in the year 2000, where uh, they, the World Trade Organization made a ruling which forced us to change, uh, to change our laws. And uh, when you do that, when an unelected bunch of people over in Europe can do that, then you no longer really are a completely sovereign nation. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, just before the break, I said after the break, which is now, so... Uh, what I'll do is get right to that, is uh, oftentimes I look at the past, I look at what's going on now, and then I project uh, what the plan is for the future, like the um, the world currency, which I said, I looked at the past, where it was coming from, like Dr. Stan says, you know, we funded the, the Soviet Revolution. In fact, William Boyce Thompson, who was uh, uh, a member of the Federal Reserve back then, put up a million dollars of his own money. And back in, you know, 1917-ish, a million dollars is... Uh, it's, it's big money now, but, you know, it was you know, $50, $100 million in, in real purchasing value today. So he puts up that much money uh, of his own for the uh, for the revolution over there. And so the the history of this thing comes on along, and then you you have uh, the, the World Trade Organization as part of GATT and so on and so on. And so I try to connect the, the past, what's going on there, uh, with uh, what's going on currently, and then looking toward the future, and remember, I said that I didn't just sit here and, you know, ponder in the outer space what was going to happen, but I looked at the cover of The Economist for January 9th of 1988, and on there it had a picture of the Phoenix, and it said, uh, pencil, the article, the editorial page about the cover, uh, said, pencil in the Phoenix for the year 2018, and that's when the world currency would come about. And I looked uh, ever since then, you know, the gradual progress is in my books, uh, my various books, I put quotes uh, since then, including during the last three, four years, where minister, ministers of finance around the world would get together and say, yeah, it looks like maybe by 2018 we'll have a world currency. So the plan is in the works. And so I, I, I have been predicting for many, many months now when people said, oh, you know, Obama is going to ruin things and the economy is going to crash. I said, no, no, not yet. And they said, well, if he's reelected, as soon as he's reelected, the thing will crash. I said, no, no, not yet, not yet. And sure enough, the stock market is still going up. But remember what I said, the stock market would, would be okay. Then you start to get, at around mid-year, you get a little inkling. By the end of the year, it starts to have really significant signs. And right after the election, you start to see the downward uh, trend. And so I was talking to one security guard uh, up at the grocery store where I am, and he's actually getting his doctorate in economics. And uh, I think he's from uh, Sierra Leone or one of these West African countries. And we, we talk uh, from time to time. He said, well, what economic indicator? Hold that, th- hold that thought. Hold that thought. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and uh, Dr. Ketty is talking about a uh, discussion with a, with a security guard who's actually getting his degree in economics. He's from Africa, and basically he's over here working to get a degree in economics. And, and what was the uh, substance of your conversation with this gentleman who's taking his degree in economics? Yeah, he's getting his Ph.D. in economics uh, here, and he'll probably go back there and be some kind of big shot. Maybe I should keep in touch with, in touch with that guy. But anyway, he's, he those typically said, well, what economic indicators do you have that uh, suggest that? And I said, look, 
It doesn't happen like that. And I try to explain to them about the dialectic and how the big shots, the paralytic, manipulate markets and how they'll drive the stock market up and drive it down and so forth. And he's nodding his head and I told him, look, look at my News with Views column called Looming Economic Disaster. And look at another column I did on News with Views called Suckernomics. And he sort of chuckled. He liked that title. And so uh, tonight, after we get off this program, I'm going to go up there and see him again because he, he works the, the, the night shift. And what I'll do is I'll say, you want some indicators? I'll give you an, indic- an indicator. Now, it's not an official government indicator, but what I tell people to do is, when things don't seem to make sense, see how it fits into the parallel plan. And I've identified some parallel members. I've talked about David Rockefeller with the secret cabal. And I talked about George Soros. So what you can do, and what I'm going to hand this guy, is I'll say, okay, here's an indicator. And I've, I've, I've told him, you know, people like Soros, watch what they do. Watch what they do. It's sort of like what Dr. Stan uh, quotes the head of the CFR saying something. You say, oh, look look what he said. This is what's coming. And, and that's right. That's right. So if you watch Soros, what he did uh, was, and you can, you can check this out. I'll give you the title if you're, you want to check this stuff out. Now, back in 2010, 2010, there was a column, June 4th of 2010. And the title of it was, The Real Story of how George Soros shorted, S-H-O-R-T-E-D, shorted the pound, etching his name into financial history forever. It's a long title. You don't have to Google all that. Just put Soros and shorted the pound. You know, Soros, Google Soros, and they quote, shorted the pound. And what that does is say exactly how he uh, he <laughs> sort of controlled uh, the ebb and flow of the uh, the British economy. And, uh, you know, they give specific things. Uh, the Bank of England's plan was to aggressively buy the pound in the hope that it would inspire confidence to stop speculators from destroying the currency. And then it goes to Germany's central bank began to attack Britain, calling for devaluation of the pound. It, you know, bullet, just bullet, bing, bing, bing. And it's a really good instructive uh, uh, lesson as to what he did in 2010. Well, now, fast forward to today and the future. And this is why I think my predictions, if you watch this stuff, you can pretty well predict where things are going to be in the future. So now you're going to Google this, or at least look this. The Wall Street Journal, just three days ago, February 18th, had a column called George Soros Doubles Down on Bearish, like a bear, the animal bear, bearish market. There's a bullish market, means it goes up, bearish means it goes down. Bearish bet. George Soros Doubles Down on Bearish Bet. And what that does is it begins, George Soros built a big bet at the end of last year, December, that the stock market was due for a tumble, a tumble. See, it's going up now. Everybody and their grandmothers out there, like, oh, look at the stock market, 1,500, 1,600, wee, good times are here again, you know, da, 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 from the 1920s. But if you watch Soros, He'll signal. He'll signal what's really going to happen in the future. So if you're interested in checking this stuff out, and why I still say the timetable that I set was, you know, mid-year, you'll see a little iffiness right after the election. You'll see the definite indicators of a of a tumble down. And after the 2014 election, here we go on the slide. And by 2016, uh, Barack Obama will probably wish he never was president, although he's, you know, he's a puppet. He's told what to do and not do anyway. He's not in control of anything. And so, and that's when, you know, the public will say, well, let's get rid of them, and we'll alternate power like Carol Quigley wants us to do. <laughs> and so the Republicans will come back in, and, you know, probably Jeb Bush with only a plurality, not an actual majority, will sort of sneak in there because, you know, he's, he's one of them. And, you know, he's like his daddy and his brother and his granddaddy and all that stuff. So anyway. Uh, if you look at this, George Dor- Soros doubled down on bearish bet, you can get an indicator of what that's all about. Now, moving along as to how I am uh, once again uh, correct in the predictions, you might remember on April 15th, I said about three or four things the terrorists could do, and sure enough, within the next week, they did them, right? And then I indicated something about the, the electric, uh, our electrical grid, and there was something sort of related to it. And then last uh, two weeks ago in the show uh, we have now, Dr. Stan's Radio Liberty, I said, aha, looky what uh, what they uh, did. And I was right after all. Well, uh, once again, what I have done is on Monday I posted a column about these, uh, I mean, pardon me, two weeks ago, I had posted a column and we talked on this program about these 
tubes on the airplanes exploding. No new terrorist threat in the tubes, right? And at that time, two weeks ago, I said yes, and, for example, cold cream jars. Cold cream jars. Well, guess what? Last night on ABC World News Tonight, Diane... Hold that thought. Hold the thought. Okay, go right ahead, Dennis. Okay. Uh, Just before uh, that break, uh, I had mentioned that uh, I had in the past, uh, in my uh, April of this year uh, column, uh, news reviews talked about things the terrorists could do. And uh, sure enough, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, what they did was reveal something that happened in California back in April that they didn't tell people at the time. So in April, May, June, July, August, people didn't know this. But at that time, they actually had 17, I believe it was, Transformers hit with sniper rifles, uh, putting a severe dent in the electrical grid. So uh, once again, they cover up stuff. It's not just stuff that we know and what they tell us, but they cover up stuff which has happened, which I had said would happen, and sure enough, it uh, does. And so uh, what I was telling uh, immediately before the break was that a couple of weeks ago uh, they had this announcement about uh, the threat of, two, uh, of toothpaste tube bombs being used on these planes. And I said that this was just like a psychological probe because they want the public dumbed down enough so the public doesn't say, well, if they could have, they could do this now and it's very simple to make, how come they haven't, you know, done something with toothpaste tubes in grocery stores and pharmacies, you know, Walmarts and Targets and all over the place, but they haven't. And at that time, at that time, two weeks ago, I mentioned, uh, for example, not just toothpaste tubes, but I said cold cream jars. And, and and sure enough, yesterday, Diane Sawyer came on and said, yes, new terrorist threat. It's been clarified. And now cold cream jars. So, you know, either I'm getting this stuff right or the terrorists are sort of tapping into Radio Liberty or something. You know, maybe they're sitting over there in Yemen logging into Radio Liberty programs. I hope not. I, you know, I'd imagine that they had more intelligence than, than that. But, hey, who knows? You know, maybe the terrorists have been dumbed down, too. Or, who knows, the paralyte may just be getting its instructions from me. Wouldn't that be a kick? Okay. So, anyway, uh, once again, these uh, predictions off are, are uh, basically uh, correct. Uh, another example of how the, the parallel does these psychological probes and hopes that the, the public is too stupid to, to understand what's going on is uh, all of the, the geniuses on ABC and CBS, and they're chuckling. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here with Dr. Kelly. Well, this is Dr. Cuddy, and this is Dr. Stan, our guest, uh, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and he's simply talking about the fact that I uh, certainly he had uh, predicted some weeks ago or uh, certainly that uh, the terrorists would uh, come down, uh, they would start using uh, the explosives and toothpaste and cold cream jars, and they've come up with this. But, ladies and gentlemen, there's really a threat from terrorism. Why don't we have a lot more terrorist attacks in America? In fact, just about every terrorist attack we've had, the government was right on top of it. In fact, their agents were working with the agent who is carrying this out. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, the reason we're not having a lot of terrorist attacks here is because they need the financial and military power of the United States to bring about their one world government and that we don't want to get the American people upset. The war on terrorism is as phony as a $3 bill. Most of the terrorists have been employed at one stage or another by our government or controlled by people who control our government or controlled by people who are paid by our government. The whole thing is phony. If there were really a a threat, we would be having chaos in America like they're having over in Iraq today. But we're not seeing it here. And the reason we're not seeing it is because it's all contrived. And the last thing they want is for the people to get upset. They need our financial and military power to consolidate power throughout the world. We're financing the people on both sides in the Ukraine. We're financing the people, certainly, uh, the, the rebels in Syria who are killing Christians. Why are we financing the rebels in Syria who are killing the Christians? Because uh, the people who control our government hate Christianity, and when you understand that, things begin to make sense. We're destabilizing the Middle East in preparation for a great war but between the Sunni and the Shia Muslims. Dr. Kennedy, you pick up the story. Do you mean to tell me that Osama bin Laden uh, wasn't hauling his dialysis machine around from cave to cave over there planning all this stuff? Well, Osama, bin, <laughs> Osama bin Laden, as you know, is simply a front for the people to put him in power, the same people who control all the presidents. Go right ahead. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, in fact, there's a, a TV show uh, just starting in the next few weeks, and it, it fits with, with this stuff. It's uh, called Mind Games. It's a new network TV show. And on there, it has like a little uh, intro, and it has one guy telling the other, he says, we're going to change people's minds without them knowing we've even done it. <laughs> and I said, yeah, right, <laughs> like that hasn't already been going on. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, one of the things, the psychological probe that they're doing is all the, the gurus of ABC and NBC and CBS and all, they, they chuckle. You know, they've been chuckling right there on the air about uh, Iran sending a ship over there. You know, we've got this fleet over the Mediterranean and so on and so on. And they say, oh, look, I think one of these uh, foreign policy experts on there said, yeah, a, uh, you know, a good trawler could take care of that Iranian ship. Ah, ha, 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 ha. What, what you're not supposed to do is ask yourself about that Iranian ship sort of off our coast. <clears throat> like, uh, what does it have on there? So forget, <clears throat> you know, forget guns. What else? might it have on that ship? Uh, you know, how about a, a thousand-year-old catapult that it flings a lot of its uh, wasted uranium products into New York City from, from long you know, they, they, they just assume that, that a ship is there, and it's a normal ship, and, you know, we can just blow it out of the water and into the problem. The, the problem with that attitude is as long as you're waiting to react to something, then by definition you allow them, whoever they are at any point in history, to act first. And unless you know in advance for sure <clears throat> what they're capable of doing, then you, you might be the victim. Yeah, we could blow the ship out of the water, but we are, gonna, are we going to do that like tomorrow without any provocation? I doubt it. And so what, what if they do have some, you know, some nasty, dirty bomb material on there? They don't have to get any intercontinental ballistic missile, right? Just a little old, you know, rocket that you buy at your local sporting goods equipment. You know, July Fourth rocket. Okay, hey, let's 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 uh, modify this sucker. Put a little super fuel on there. Attach, uh, you know, we'll put about five or six of them together. We'll put a big old rubber band around <laughs> around the thing, and then we'll launch this uh, this these uh, dirty nuclear spent material. And uh, hopefully it'll go seven miles. And I think we'd get it that far. And boing, there goes Manhattan. <laughs> well, of course, but they actually the Iranians have ballistic missiles. They have sophisticated ballistic missiles. In sure. fact, John Kerry is demanding that they give up their ballistic missiles as well as their effort, of course, to develop nuclear weapons. And basically, of course, I don't think the Iranians are going to do that. I don't think that. In fact, I really suspect they already have nuclear weapons. I was told 20 years ago by a key purple person in government that the Iranians had nuclear weapons at that time. But the last thing they want is for the American people to realize that we do very, face very real threats today. Keep everybody happy watching television, watching City, the, the latest NFL game or baseball game or basketball game. Keep the people entertained while, of course, they continue their progressive march towards the one world government, the one world financial system with the destruction of our economic system, the impoverishment of our people and the destruction of Christianity. Go right ahead, Dennis. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the Iranians have uh, ballistic missiles and, uh, and long-range ballistic missiles. But uh, the, the point I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make is, you know, even some you know thug ruling the Baluchistan or something, all he has to do is get some boat. And he just sits out there about seven miles off of the coast of New York, <laughs> and uh, he has this little little rocket thing that he's purchased at you know, some, some cheap disposal place that, uh, you know, has leftover stuff from their national holiday. And uh, it's, it's fairly easy to get some, you know, some dirty nuclear material and stick it on one of these little rockets and zap it into New York City. I mean, I mean I'm oversimplifying it, but the point is we, we should not take anything like an Iranian ship sitting off of our coast as some kind of joke. It, it may not be a joke. It may be that the Iranians do have some nasty little thing on there and some nasty little rocket that could go the minimal, you know, seven miles. It's no big deal. And once you dirty up uh, the Manhattan, uh, I mean, okay, so you don't kill, you know, a million people. Big deal. You can, you can create a lot of havoc if you just get a rocket with some dirty nuclear material to explode in the middle of Manhattan. It's just that simple. So anyway... Uh, and the uh, 
the last thing I'll say is, uh, of course, there's the secret Nazi plan, and that's my next to last book, uh, which is all, which is part of the larger Paralytes plan. And uh, what they do is, like I said, sort of psychological probes. And what you want as part of the secret Nazi plan, of course, he picked up from Margaret Sanger, who got her money and funding all for the Rockefellers and all this eugenics movement, which was around in the early part of the 1900s. I think they had the first International Eugenics Congress in 1912, and you had Charles Elliott there, head of Harvard. And, you know, it was you know, a lot of big, big names. And Woodrow Wilson had one of these forced sterilization laws when he was governor of New Jersey, and <clears throat> all of these people were really into uh, uh, eugenics. And so... As part of that, you would have uh, a euthanasia program, and the, the Nazis basically learned from us or picked it uh, picked it up from us. And so, what you what you would do is like uh, Terry Schiavo in Florida, but you do it on a national scale. So you do a nas- you do a Terry Schiavo, and that's that's the precedent. The American public goes, "Oh my, isn't that awful?" But they allow it to happen, see, which they didn't have to allow to happen. Jeb Bush did not allow have to allow that to happen, just like he didn't have to allow Elian Gonzalez to be returned to Castro, which is what Castro said you're doing. You're not returning Elian to his father. You're returning to me, to me, uh, the dictator of uh, Cuba. And so, what you do on an international scale is you use a single country. And so, the first country here is uh, for children. So you got to euthanize and be able to euthanize everybody, not just grandma, not just granny, you know, or the uh, you know, or the thirty-five year old who is now incapacitated can't do anything. So, what happened is this past December, the Belgium Belgium Senate passed a bill that will extend euthanasia to children with disabilities. Get it? I mean, this is like, you know, the Nazis are, like I said, it's the fulfillment of the secret Nazi plan. They said perhaps two generations. So the psychological probe is let's get a country, in this case it's Belgium, and let's get a governmental body, the Senate, say, okay, now we're going to euthanize children with disabilities. Okay, so picture yourself. There's Belgium. There's a hospital in uh, Antwerp. There's a child. He has disabilities. Okay, he's gone. He's gone. And, and why is that different from Nazi Germany? It's not different from Nazi Germany. And so that's why I say the, the fulfillment of the secret Nazi plan was perhaps two generations, which is now. Now. Okay, so I've rattled off about five or six things. And once again, we're practically at the end of the program, and we haven't gotten to the book. But I, I just think it's important to show how uh, all of this, and the, the book, uh, not only the secret Nazi plan, uh, Parallel the Secret Nazi Plan is available from Radio Liberty, but also the Parallel, their history and future, my most recent book available from Radio Liberty, isn't just sort of a lesson in history. It's not just that you know somebody did something with the Illuminati or the Knights Templar. It shows the progression coming up to today and then looking toward the future, toward the future. And so the chapter in the book with the last uh, about ten minutes that we got that we're on now, uh, the Parallel, their history and future, as I said, is called the Parallel's Use of Misdirection. And uh, one of the, this is one of their primary mechanisms uh, that they will use to accomplish their the goals. And if you look historically, uh, many people uh, have been, let's say, misdirected into believing that the American Civil War was fought over the existence of slavery in the South. You know, okay, Civil War, we're going to free the slaves, that's why we have the Civil War. Well, actually, only about 7% of the of Southerners, the, the Deep South, the 11 Deep South Southern states, owned slaves at the time of the war. Uh, but uh, as I said, in one of my news, early news with news columns, uh, and in uh, my book about the secret Nazi plan, I related that the parallel tactic of uh, promoting an issue, let's say the abolition of slavery, uh, that would split the U.S. Uh, so the parallel could create a Gulf empire, consisting of uh, the southern states along with Central America and the Caribbean islands. And so, you know, without going into all the details, I put the details in the book so that you can see that's what was really happening. Uh, They wanted that issue, abolition of slavery, that would divide the north and the south. And so they, you know, they went through that whole process. I I specifically put uh, a speech from 1809 by the British emissary from uh, Canada, and he's talking in in, uh, Massachusetts. And so he's developing the strategy and then uh, come up to the time of the beginning of the Civil War, and Lincoln has appointed John Lothrop Motley as his minister to Vienna, and he's gone over to England, and he's riding home from England before he gets to Vienna back to his mother. And he says, Mom, I've uh, uncovered this conspiracy. They want to divide the North and the South and create this Gulf Empire, uh, which means the deep southern states uh, joined with Central America and the Caribbean islands, as he said, quote, 
to uh, have unlimited Negroes producing unlimited cheap products, in quote. And, of course, when that uh, didn't pan out exactly, they had to have come up, you know, with NAFTA and so forth, unlimited Hispanics. And then you have GATT, and you have the, you know, global economy, so you have unlimited Chinese, unlimited Bangladeshis, unlimited everybody producing unlimited cheap products, uh, apparently except for Americans, where we lose our manufacturing jobs so that we could be impoverished, because all of this is one big leveling process. So I drive our wages down, the rest of the world comes up, and isn't this nice? And that's what David Rockefeller, with his secret cabal, uh, has uh, been up to, uh, conspiring against the best interests of the United States, quote-unquote. And in another uh, news with vo- use volume, uh, column, I put another example of misdirection, and that's uh, about the Cuban Missile Crisis, as I said. You know, it's presented as one thing. And in this case, uh, the Soviets actually wanted us to see that they had placed these long-range nuclear missiles in Cuba so that we would demand their removal and that they would agree to comply in exchange for our assurance there would be no further attempts by us to invade Cuba. Uh, and the, the guarantee, of course, would enable uh, them, the Soviets, to use Cuba then as a communist revolutionary training ground for all of Latin America, you know, like Nicaragua and Africa. And Africa, not just not just Latin America, Nicaragua, but Africa. They they specialized in Angola. They, you know, they just get a beach in. You, you start in Angola, then you spread. All right. Now, in my book uh, mentioned above uh, in the, this chapter, which is the secret Nazi plan, I had described how Eleanor Dulles, she's the sister of Alan and John Foster Dulles, had discovered information about Nelson Rockefeller working with the Nazis, and they uh, that was used to coerce him, Nelson, into agreeing to deliver the uh, Latin American bloc of votes. <clears throat> uh, this would be in the UN uh, for the <clears throat> for the uh, establishment of the nation of Israel, and that would be in exchange in exchange for the Israelis not pursuing escape Nazis uh, after the Second World War, or you know, uh, blabbing about Nelson and the Dulles uh, boys and uh, their corporate buddy heads uh, who had done all these nasty shenanigans, shenanigans working with the Nazis. And I think it's so important people understand that probably between ten and 30,000 Nazis escaped to South America in something called the Rat Line, but Adolf Hitler escaped there, too, and the Jews never went after them because they had this secret agreement. Yep. They could have Israel, certainly, or they could go after the Nazis, which did they want, but they couldn't do both, and they decided they wanted Israel, and so they left them. There were only two, I think, in South America, Klaus Barbie and, and certainly Adolf Eichmann that were ever tracked down. Why do you think the Jews Jews didn't go after the Nazis, very simply because they were told oh, they could have Israel or they could have the, Jew, the, the Nazis, but and so they choose Israel. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, technically, uh, only Adolf Eichmann uh, fell into the, that category, and then there was such a stink they didn't do it again until Klaus Barbie, but Klaus was right after. Nelson Rockefeller died in 1979, so they didn't get Klaus until the early 80s. And even he wasn't taken back there. He was called the Butcher of Lyon, which is in France. And so, I mean, yeah, there were two, but actually only Adolf, Adolf Eichmann. So anyway, but I think uh, personally that this may have been an example of misdirection again, uh, because uh, I, my question in the book that I raise is, do you really believe the Dulles brothers were so clumsy as to leave carelessly around such information uh, laying about for their sister to find. I, I sort of doubt that. You know, oh, look, we forgot our stuff. It's on the tea table so Eleanor can fi- find it. And so what I said is perhaps this was actually an example of misdirection and the guarantee of non-pursuit of Nazis after World War II was the goal all along uh, because uh, such non-pursuit was critical to the fulfillment of the secret Nazi plan. So that, that's what I think they really wanted all along. So it, this is another example, I think, of misdirection. You know, you point one way, it looks like something is going on for this particular reason, but it's really for another. And at this point, uh, I think it's important to remember uh, that in the 1950s, the Egyptian uh, president, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, he discovered that the Muslim Brotherhood, which has been in the news the last couple of years, uh, which had allied with the Nazis uh, beginning in the 1930s, had already, already in the 50s, been infiltrated by American and other intelligence agencies. And uh, Nasser, and remember this, Nasser, he had, Nasser had been helped by over 100 Nazi veterans subcontracted by the CIA. Remember that now. The Nazis, veterans, subcontracted by the, subcontracted by the CIA, 
were helping Nasser in the 50s. And so in 1957, he has that famous uh, statement that Dr. Uh, Stan is related to you, where he says, quote, The genius of you Americans is that you never make clear-cut stupid mistakes, only complicated stupid moves, which make us wonder the possibility that there may be something we're missing. And I I think think what Dr. Cuddy said is so vitally important. Uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood was infiltrated by the American intelligence. The American intelligence was working with the Muslim Brotherhood. It always has, going back certainly uh, to the time immediately after the Second World War. And they're working with them today. Why? Well, you can't have a war unless you have an enemy, can you? The best enemy American intelligence money could buy. We'll be back in just a moment to wrap up the program. Our guest has been Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Dennis, we've got three minutes for you to wrap up the program. Okay, well, I'll just make a couple more comments from this chapter about the, the power leak. And uh, to, to the extent, as Dr. Stan has said, the American government has been the primary enforcer of the power leak's will over the last second or several decades, uh, you need to be suspicious about what they're doing. The power leak, uh, from uh, North Africa over to Afghanistan as part of the secret Nazi plan, which is a sub-part of their larger plan, for example, Egyptian President Morsi, <clears throat> who is now behind these glass, like in this glass cage uh, where he can't talk, uh, was part of this. Uh, but, you know, we build them up, we tear them down. We build up Gaddafi, we take them out. We build up uh, <clears throat> Saddam Hussein, we take them out. Same thing with Afghan President Ahmed Karzai. Uh, all of these people, including American presidents, are basically puppets. Obama's a puppet, Bush is a puppet, all of this. So, uh, so that the uh, apparently can, as I would say, pull the strings of his puppets, uh, presidents, uh, have monitors. And so that's another thing I try to look at. You have Colonel Edward Mandel House. He monitored the activities of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I also asked, do you really believe Hillary Clinton just happened to meet Bill Clinton at the library at Yale University? I think she was a handler. Uh, also, do you really believe that Huma Abedin, uh, just happened to be, uh, the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton's Deputy Chief of Staff? Uh, when Abedin has three family members associated with organizations having ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, likewise, do you really believe Valerie Jarrett just happens to be perhaps the closest advisor to President Obama? And she was born in Iran in 1956 to a father who, had, who was in Iran from 1950 uh, to 1961, which perhaps coincidentally, maybe, includes the time the CIA was overthrowing Iranian leader Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953. Uh, do you really believe uh, Paralyte agent Big Nef Brzezinski just happens to be an advisor to President Obama? And Brzezinski, after advising President Jimmy Carter to support the Ayatollah Khomeini following the Shah's uh, abdication in 1979, recently has been strongly advising President Obama not to take military action against Iran to prevent it from uh, developing a nuclear weapon, even though Israel's informed that they believe their existence may depend upon such action. So anyway, uh, that's what I had the place I am in this particular chapter, the parallel uh, use of misdirection, and uh, we'll pick up next time. All right, fine. Well, I guess it's been Dr. Dennis Cuddy. His book is The Power Elite, uh, Their Future, pardon me, Their Future and their, their History and Their Future. God bless. We'll talk to you next week at the same time. Thanks for having me. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you. This is Dr. Stan, and let me suggest that if you really want to understand what's going on, you need to read Dr. Cuddy's books. I consider him the foremost historian of our times. We carry his books, The Power Elite and The Secret Nazi Plan. We carry his uh, book on uh, suddenly The Power Elite, Other History and Their Future. And we have several other books by him that are available. Just give us a call at 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. And understand that most of what you believe is not true, that most of what you read in the newspaper is not true, that the media is controlled. We have a wonderful book on that, written by a left-wing professor, Professor Ben, ba- ben Bagdikian, who, uh, from the University of California in Berkeley School of Journalism there. And he studied the ju- of media control for 30 years. The book, The New Media Monopoly. You need to get the book. You need to read 
read the book, you need to understand that uh, they create our reality through television, through radio, through books, through newspapers, and they largely control what the American people think and believe. But suddenly this small little clique that we talk about is using the financial and military power of the United States to bring about a world government. Why are we suddenly financing the rebels in Syria when the rebels there are killing and raping and murdering the Christians and burning the Christian villages? Why are we supporting the people who are killing the Christians? Why, for the same reason, of course, we've installed governments under Sharia law in both um, Afghanistan and Iraq. The people there do not want governments under Sharia law. They're Muslims. They don't want their governments to be imposing Sharia law, but that's what we have done. Oh, well, we say they're Muslim countries. They need Sharia law. This is not what they want. But we are in the process of destabilizing the whole world with your tax money, and one day America is going to be held responsible for what we're doing. And the good people of America are responsible, not for what they do, but for, because of what they don't do. Because men and women become accomplices to the evils they fail to oppose. Men and women become accomplices to the evils they fail to oppose. And ladies and gentlemen, we're financing certainly the rebels, certainly over in Kiev. And certainly then, of course, what you're seeing over in the Ukraine today is a battle between Russia and, and the United States. We're financing the, the rebels on one side. Russia is financing the government on the other side. But you need to get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness. That's Brotherhood of Darkness to understand that we're also working very closely with the Russians, but we don't want the American people to understand that. We're working very closely with the Chinese leaders. Why do you think we give them special breaks as far as bringing their products into America? They can bring their products in here with little or no tariffs when we try to take our products into China. Very, very high tariffs there. So we have a massive trade imbalance with communist China. We have a trade deficit of at least uh, uh, at least half a trillion dollars a year. We have certainly a national deficit of uh, a trillion dollars a year. And ladies and gentlemen, you can't continue spending money that you don't have. They're having to borrow money to give out the money for food stamps and for Social Security and Medicare. We are running a deficit. Well, they claim it's only going to be $600 billion this next year, but then they consistently lie. And you don't remember a year from now what they said this year. Barack Hussein Obama under his regime. Remember, Barack Hussein Obama is simply a figurehead for the power elite. But Barack Hussein Obama has increased the federal deficit by from $10.7 trillion to seven point three now $7.4 trillion uh, in a matter simply of, uh, of uh, five years. It's gone from 10.7 to 17.3, now $17.4 trillion, essentially in a little over five years. The whole idea is to bankrupt America. We're already bankrupt morally. We're already bankrupt spiritually. They've infiltrated our churches. They've changed the music of our churches. You notice how the music has changed? and how the message of the church has changed, and how most ministers will not speak out about the political issues or certainly the satanic forces working at the highest levels of our government. Please pray for Radio Liberty, our provision, and our protection. 